Bothell City Council is back from break and we'll start on AB 17-161, which is the 2017 UW Bothell Cascadia College Campus Master Plan, Comprehensive Plan and Code Amendments and Concommitment Development Agreement. And we have um, Mr. Boyd to kick us off. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Um, uh, this is not supposed to show that way. Let me just get out of the presenter. There, that's better. Um, this is the uh, the first of three uh, touches the council will have on this, and and the culmination of a, a long process of uh, planning uh, with uh, the University of Washington Bothell Cascadia College, and with the community and and staff has been working on this. Uh, for quite some time, uh, keeping the interests of the city and, and the surrounding community uh, at the forefront. Uh, the city has actually been working uh, with the institutions and the surrounding communities since before the siting of the campus uh, uh, in the downtown area uh, in 1998. Uh, and then there's still some staff that have been working on this uh, over the last few months that we're, we're here for that, uh, that, uh, begin those beginnings. Um, the, in, 19, in 2005, we expanded the boundaries of the, uh, or adjusted the boundaries of the downtown sub area uh, to include the campus because we recognized that uh, the campus was an important part of our downtown. Uh, and, and I've been working uh, uh, closely with the campus ever since then. Last year, uh, we council uh, approved uh, planning code amendments that uh, did expand the campus to the expan expansion area shown in the aerial image on the right there, and made some uh, updates to the uh, community vision portion of the, the downtown uh, sub area plan uh, that are shown here in this slide. And uh, those, uh, at that time, we also established the framework for the uh, campus master plan and the work that's been going on uh, uh, over most of this past year. So with that, I'm going to, uh, this is mainly uh, the institutions show. So uh, we have with us tonight, we have uh, 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 Eric Murray, uh, president of Cascadia, Cascadia Community College, and Kelly Snyder, assistant vice chancellor of uh, University of Washington Bothell. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Eric first, uh, and then uh, he and, and Kelly will be presenting the campus master plan. And then I will, uh, come on at the end and, and go work through the packet and show you the, the items that uh, council will be reviewing and approving over the next month. Good evening, council members. Hello, nice to see you all again. I'm here today to represent the executive leadership of the campus, both for Cascadia and for UW Bothell. In the long history that the two institutions have of working together, I can tell you that we have never ever worked more collaboratively on a project than we have on this master plan. The two institutions stand very united in the vision that this plan represents. Uh, we've worked collaboratively together and with city staff to make sure it represents what we think is the future of the campus. Not everyone is gonna be happy with every aspect of the master plan, and we understand that. As development happens in any of our projects, uh, there are always folks who are worried about the impacts of that development. Uh, with that in mind, it's important, I think, for us to remember that Cascadia and Utah Bothell not only are partners with Bothell, but we're put here by the legislature because of the potential growth in the area over the 50 to 100 years that were envisioned back when we were started, but that we also represent not only the city of Bothell, but the entire region at large on the east side as a resource for students in our community. So development is, needs to happen if we're going to reach that full potential. I'm very pleased by the results of the master plan. Uh, I'm looking forward to your review of it and your questions, and I hope we can answer those satisfactorily to get us to a conclusion to the project. I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly now for, for her remarks, and she'll walk you through the whole plan. Thanks. Good evening, council members. I'm Kelly Snyder with the University of Washington Bothell. I'll be here on behalf of our staff team and our administration just to walk through. So you all should have received one of these books. Um, so hopefully you have those with you. If not, it'll be all online for your time to take a look at it. Um, 
This is also available both on our UW Bothell and Cascadia Campus Master Plan websites. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through a few slides here and um, talk about some of the highlights of these things and then as Dave pointed out, he'll get some to some details and then um, I'm sure we'll leave some time for um, Q&A at the end. So last time we were here before you uh, was in March and I talked, so some of these slides will be similar. So we have a campus master plan guiding principles. We wanted to make sure that we had some way to lead the path for ourselves as we created this. Um, we wanna make sure that we have a very cohesive character to the campus. Right now it's a bit bits and pieces as we've added um, some land. And so we wanna make sure it's very cohesive. Um, we wanna make sure that the facilities and infrastructure, one of the things that we um, discovered and learned through this process um, was that we need to, after this is done and adopted and move forward, we're gonna look at our infrastructure. Um, there's parts of the campus that go out with electricity and power outages and the other half is on and yet we still have to cancel class for the whole campus. Um, it's important that our, our housing have um, uh, the lights on and um, warm beds to sleep in so we need to address some of the infrastructure on our campus. Um, and <clears throat> We have a lot of ideas about improving our mobility and accessibility and making sure as we've had a lot of feedback about, yes, you're in the downtown, but you face east. So how can we figure out how to use Beardsley Boulevard to make a connection to the core of the downtown? And that's important to us. It's important to you. It's important to the community. And how do we do that in a very um, respectful way? So there were some um, issues that we wanted to make sure to address and um, make sure that we establish the new land use regulations. Um, so that's very transparent, both to the campus, to the city, as well as our community. That's important to us. Um, the PUD process has perhaps not been the, uh, it's been a little clunky for what um, everybody wants to do to engage. And so I think we've come up with a process that um, will be helpful to everybody. We wanted to test different options of what the campus might look at. So we had kind of a grow north option, grow south option, and kind of grow in the middle. The fourth alternative is kind of a blend of those things, and you'll see how um, those came together. And these do cost, uh, it does cost money to implement and build any of the things that are on campus, whether it's infrastructure, uh, buildings, parking garages, and you'll hear me probably say this a couple of times. Um, there's $29.5 million worth of parking in the capital budget in the legislature right now that has not been passed. We are anxious to build more parking on campus, and as soon as that's passed, we're gonna get ready for design. Um, Near-term vision, so we know, we, we know there are certain things that are gonna um, be built um, soon. Both you know, Buffalo and Cascadia are in the pipeline for an additional academic building. There's a lot of interest in um, building housing and, and obviously some parking. So those are kind of in the near term. And then we have the long term, which is really full um, build out. Um, that may happen in 20 years, it may, it may take longer. Um, we oftentimes talk about uh, Cascadia will get one building, academic building, once every 10 years. I think for UW Bothell, it's one every six to eight years. So it's going to take a long time to build these things out. Um, we wanted to make sure, as Dr. Murray said, that we are doing this as partners with Cascadia College, both UW Buffalo and Cascadia, and we share those infrastructures and facilities, and we wanna make sure that we understand the financial commitment that goes with these things, and uh, we have different processes of getting things approved, so we wanted to make sure that that is included in this plan. And uh, as part of the passage of Sound Transit 3, there is gonna be some sort of increase of transit service um, through the city of Bothell and including on our campus. We wanna make sure that we are accommodating, right now our transit center on campus is at and beyond capacity. So what does that look like in the future? And um, city staff and the, those from campus are gonna work together um, with Sound Transit to figure out what, what might happen um, both on campus as well as in a connection to downtown. So there's some advantages of working through a campus master plan. Um, we've done some minor updates over time, uh, but hadn't really done a really comprehensive look. And so um, we wanted to have a plan that was very flexible, make sure that it was accommodating the needs in the future, um, emphasizes co-location, um, and really looks at those new facilities in a way that's very pedestrian friendly. Um, there are several moments on our campus where people have to dodge cars and buses and delivery trucks and 
those kind of delivery trucks sometimes have chemicals in them. We want to make sure that we're being really thoughtful about pedestrian pathways. And it's not just for our students, faculty, and staff. We have lots and lots of folks from the community who come through and walk their dogs or ride their bikes. And so we want to make that uh, make sure that our campus is very friendly. So it's definitely an opportunity. You'll keep hearing me talk about the finances. It's a rough time for higher education uh, in Olympia. It's not a required uh, funding uh, mechanism within the Constitution. So with very limited resources, we have to be very careful. Um, uh, we, we can't go to the um, uh, ballot to get funds. Uh, so we every dollar we get, we have to be really thoughtful about. And um, we want to be very strategic about how we apply those dollars. Um, we want to show our uh, community that we want to enhance our campus. We had a town gown um, campus committee and just kind of focused on transportation, but as some of our neighbors know that it ended up being much, much bigger than that. So we are going to reconstitute that and make it a stronger committee um, and address a whole wide variety of issues. Talks about transit again, maximizing the transit operations on campus and looking at alternative funding mechanisms. As a, we are also a state agency, both of us, and um, we have the possibility of doing a public-private partnership. We see that there might be some potentials there um, as it relates to housing, maybe some mixed use, um, maybe some office spaces. So this should look familiar to you. We've had this for a while now. Uh, we've checked off step one, two, and three. And uh, uh, step four says it's summertime. Well, it took a little bit longer than that, but that's all right. Uh, as the city manager likes to say, this is a once in a lifetime project. I hope, uh, I think Amy, this is your second one though, right? Um, one of our staff has been with the campus that long. So, um, uh, but this is a really hearty document. We've put a lot of time and energy and thoughtfulness into it, and we hope that it lasts a very long time. There's the flexibility in there to um, really think clearly about what types of um, facilities are in each types of the zones that we have on campus. So hopefully in a couple, maybe, maybe in November, we'll have an adopted um, campus master plan. So there's been a lot of community outreach. Several of you have attended these community meetings. Um, sometimes they were in the format that you see here, uh, classroom style. Sometimes they were in living rooms. Sometimes they're out on back porch decks. Um, sometimes they were coming to the office and, and we really wanted to be as open and flexible about communicating. There were lots and lots of other ways. Um, it wasn't just in person, but also on our website. Uh, in the back of the plan, you'll see a whole public participation element that we had for this uh, plan. Uh, we did social media. Uh, we found that on campus, because uh, we had an on campus community, um, we wanted to make sure that they were super engaged. Um, Amy and I went through and did lots of presentations to our various interest groups on campus. We felt the most effective piece, though, was standing in the library. The library, we just put our posters up, had some comment sheets, and we just stood there and answered questions for hours. And it was a really effective way to get people coming and going. And um, they were really very insightful and thoughtful. Our faculty and staff, both for UW Bothell and Cascadia, gave us lots of comments, um, both about the environment, about accessibility, about where transit was. Um, and as much as we have our wonderful neighbors who have given us lots of feedback, so has our on-campus community. So there are six sections in your um, the campus master plan that you have. Um, I won't go through all the details, but we'll do, do some highlights here. So um, this plan is very similar to the PUD when the campus was first um, started. It was intention of growing to 10,000 FTE. So 6,000 for UW Bothell and 4,000 for Cascadia. This plan does the same thing. Even though we're adding some land and we're adding some types of uses like housing, the plan is built on 10,000 FTE. We are currently at about 7,800, 7,900, so we're getting very close. These are um, statistics from last fall. So um, in higher education world, we have to wait to the 10th day. We're only at day, this is Tuesday, so day seven. So we have three more days because they can drop classes and add classes and register and those types of things. So we'll have new data here soon. Um, we're pretty much staying flat though right now because we need some more space funded by the legislature. So. How do we plan uh, in higher education? It's about gross square footage per student. Um, combined between us and um, Cascadia, we're about 80 square feet per student. We're very compressed. Um, and we, and through this plan, 
how do we define how many number of buildings? We're planning for 150 square feet per student. And that's how we know this much square feet of new building space is needed. What well, says 90, not 80. 90 square feet, look at that. We gained something somewhere. Um, so we are talking about new square footage on campus, more than what we have today, as you can see. You'll notice um, we're also looking for parking um, up to 4,200 stalls, which is about 1,700 new stalls. In this plan, we uh, define development areas. So we have A through F, and uh, you'll probably get some questions about C, so I want to just highlight that for a second. C is the zone that's adjacent to our single family neighborhood to the west of the campus, and there are special conditions, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, for that particular area. B is kind of the core of the campus that we have today. E is the space between Campus Way, which is the lower road on campus, up to the trail itself. And you'll see in the future development, a lot of our student types of functions and activities, the extension of the Activities and Recreation Center we have now, the housing that we are proposing is in that area in E versus in C or other places. Um, and uh, A is more about parking. There's lots of need for parking, we know. D, let me just highlight D for a second. Currently our Husky Village is at that location and um, uh, it's uh, not probably not a long-term solution to have just housing in that location. So you'll see in the proposed plan, there could be academic buildings, office um, spaces there. It could be as integrated as part of a transit center in that location. So there's lots of ideas about how to use that space. So here's the near-term near vision. Uh, there are as you see, Campus Way identified um, between kind of the gray buildings. The orange buildings to the right of that are um, the extension of the Activities and Recreation Center I mentioned and the student housing. To the left of that, you'll see two longer buildings and those are the two academic buildings that are in the pipeline, one for Cascadia and one for UW Bothell. Uh, those are kind of the near-term vision we see in the next maybe five to seven years, some maybe a little bit sooner, some a little bit later. It's very unpredictable to know when we can get funding um, through the legislature for the academic buildings and when we'd be able to borrow funds. Those are things that the state doesn't fund. They don't fund housing or parking and things we have to borrow for. Long-term vision, there is more orange on this um, particular one. You'll see that um, the core of the campus, remember the alternatives one, two, and three that we talked about earlier through the EIS process, we combined those. We felt like the core of the campus could get developed first and then we would spread north so that we had that connection to the downtown. And that's a really important aspect for us. We have this population, they need to eat they want to recreate, they want to visit City Hall, no. uh, they want to be able to, <laughs> um, they, they just want to live within the community that they are going to school. And this is a great opportunity to kind of really put a face and front to the campus. Uh, I will point out, because this has come up a number, of, a number of times, at the very south end of campus where it says State Route 522, you'll see a big orange um, block there. That is parking at the south end of campus. It's a structured parking garage. Um, we know because that's in a hillside, that is a $50 million parking facility, and that's a very expensive facility for us to build. Um, it may not be one of the first things we build because it's so expensive and we have to borrow for it, and we only have so much borrowing capacity. So this is what our architects have crafted to what does it look like in three-dimensional, um, looking from the east, going, looking towards the west, and um, what it looks like along Beardsley, um, the gray building, dark gray buildings are existing buildings, and the kind of wider, lighter buildings are the new buildings. So I'm going to give you some ideas of what the renderings might look like. These are also in your um, plan. This is development area B and E, essentially campus way. One of the things we've talked about is to reduce the uh, impacts and conflicts between pedestrians and vehicles. And if we were able to um, uh, still allow fire service, where's the fire chief? Uh, still allow fire service through that area, but make it a pedestrian friendly environment. As soon as you have student housing, let's say off to the right, um, and the current um, UW one building off to the left, you could have this be a very great kind of street fair street or a walking street or bicycling street. Lots of great um, interactions with those buildings there. 
This is along Beardsley, uh, rendering for development area D. This is where Husky Village is currently, and um, yes, you do see the word bookstore there. Um, uh, it, it could potentially look like this, um, could be office buildings in this location, could be coffee shops, uh, could be housing in this location. There's some flexibility that has been built into the code for this particular zone. So some of the feedback um, that we've received is about uh, the setbacks and buffers related to development area C, the property that's adjacent to single family um, homes. And so this is one of four exhibits that we have within the plan. We thought it might be helpful to have a, a clearer understanding about if a building goes so high, how far does it have to go back? What does the buffer what is the building setback? And for every um, foot up you go, we have to go three more feet back. Um, you'll see onto the right of the image, it's 110th Avenue Northeast. So you can see that it gets pretty close to the roadway, but it is still farther back um, from the residents. This is one of four illustrations. I thought I'd bring this forward. This looked like probably the most likely, um, given what we think might go in that location. We're not sure. Uh, it, that's also provided as flexibility. What we do know in Z or in this um, development area C, we would not put a dormitory. So we talked a lot about built environments. What is equally and important to us is those things that are green. We love our trees. We love our outdoor spaces. Our, the animals do, the people do. We use them for outdoor classrooms. We need to use these spaces for um, stormwater runoff. Um, it's incredibly important to us. And we have so many letters from our campus, uh, from the, the folks on our campus, um, that this is important to them. They use the trees as their classroom. Um, so we identified those within the plan. Um, and I think that they felt like that was really good. Now I wanna really emphasize, you'll see this over and over again, and staff find it somewhere but amusing now, I'm getting t-shirts made that says, graphics are for illustrative purposes only. So even though it has a block there, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's exactly where the building will go. It's within that development zone. So if we, this follows topography, we try to be thoughtful about that, but this is really a planning level document. When we go to design and build, we'll be um, a lot more thoughtful about, okay, we have to preserve this clump of trees. We need to adjust the building this particular way because we want to have that preservation. So there are a series of partnering commitments. Um, there are existing partnering commitments within um, conditions within the planned unit development that there is today. We worked really closely with staff um, to define what these things are. And um, I'm happy to go into detail, but these are kind of the seven that are highlighted. I think I talked about number seven already, the Campus Town Community Advisory Committee. Um, as part of that, we also are committing to a transportation management plan, reporting our numbers for parking as well as um, uh, single um, uh, bus usage, U cars, all sorts of other types, bicycles, walking. Um, the campus entrances, we are committing to keeping those restricted. There are two um, on the west side of campus. You know, that's been a really important thing with our um, uh, adjacent community transit facilities. Um, it's important to continue to have transit on our campus um, through the sound transit planning process. Uh, we want to make sure that it stays there until a new solution is created and then implemented. Um, Northeast Valley View Drive. Um, it's important to have additional uh, sidewalks in that particular area, and there's a trigger component to when we create housing at the south end of campus. Um, we suspect that that'll kind of really draw students um, in that direction. Um, there's uh, a crosswalk that uh, we worked jointly with Cascadia, Utah Bothell, and the campus to put a crosswalk across uh, Beardsley Boulevard right now, and that is gonna go to design. Um, there's some additional detail commitments about land um, on Beardsley Boulevard um, from 110th over to the freeway. That's similar to the PUD and the trail crossing. So the trail crossing is a shared use trail that goes over 405. Um, we're, we are definitely motivated to work with WashDOT to make sure that that happens um, uh, so that it benefits our greater community. I guess that's it for me. So thank you. Thank you to your staff 
for all of the work that they've done this last few months and oh well over a year now it's really been helpful thank you to your commitment to the campus and supporting us and and making challenging us and keeping our feet to the fire it's important for us to be a good community neighbor uh, we know that this is an asset but we also know that we need to um, offset some impacts and um, that's our commitment to you is um, being able to plan for that well and uh, figuring out how we can best be the best neighbors. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, and there'll be an opportunity to ask questions of any of the presenters and, and other staff uh, at the end, of course. Um, so we will be asking you to approve the campus master plan, but that and the campus master plan includes uh, some chapters that are devoted to our comprehensive plan and uh, code amendments. Uh, but there are these these segments that are actually going to be adopted uh, as part of uh, part of the uh, comprehensive plan and and the city code. And that's what I'm going to touch on here. Uh, the long term vision that Kelly just uh, uh, presented does uh, call for in, in the in the future redeveloping the Husky Village site to create a more urban front door for the campus. Uh, the, the description of the campus district in the comprehensive plan portion of the downtown plan uh, describes uh, a campus developed behind a, a pretty substantial vegetated buffer. Uh, so we felt that it was necessary to be consistent with that vision to, to make some slight changes here to the uh, comprehensive plan, which are shown in the yellow highlights uh, on this page. Um, kind of overlaid on top of the amendments that were made last year. And then moving on to the implementing code amendments, um, the and I'm just going to hit on some highlights here. Uh, as Kelly described, the, they've divided the campus into these uh, development areas. And this table, uh, uh, which will go into the, the code, uh, establishes the heights, the setbacks, and to some extent, the uses. Uh, this is where the uh, the um, pro the prohibition of dormitories in uh, development area C is found, and uh, and then establishes uh, maximum net new gross square footage for each development area. Now the total of these adds up to a little bit more than the the overall maximum uh, footage, just to give them some flexibility. They can they can as they move forward they can do a little more in one area and a little less in another. Uh, the notes to that table, um, uh, I, I need to point out, uh, there's, there was an error in your package that, and some of you may have noticed that the, uh, that, uh, the, the note for under uh, general architectural regulations was the same as um, for the Beardsley Boulevard frontage. So uh, what, I've, uh, what I have up on the screen now, and uh, I left uh, uh, copies of this page for the clerk to hand out. Uh, um, have the correct language there. Uh, but basically these notes to that table uh, provide for size limitations on retail uses on the campus so that they can have the bookstore uh, and uh, some of those services that they need for their, their campus population, uh, but without uh, unduly competing with, uh, with other downtown retail. Uh, along Beardsley Boulevard, we uh, are saying that that development needs to fully comply with the architectural regulations in the downtown plan because it is directly across the street from other uh, development that will be controlled uh, by the downtown plan. And we'll limit that to four floors and 45 feet for a depth of, of 50 feet. So you'll have similar heights uh, along Beardsley Boulevard as you, uh, uh, as you come into downtown or, or head out of downtown. And then under general arch architectural regulations, the campus has a very uh, robust architectural review process. Uh, so uh, we're uh, uh, recommending here that we adopt regulations that use uh, the downtown plan architectural regulations uh, for guidance uh, and apply the, uh, the sections of the uh, downtown core district, uh, which allows for the biggest buildings uh, on scale with the, the campus buildings uh, to that, to the street frontages along the North Creek Trail uh, in, the, in the campus. Uh, other uh, uh, highlights include uh, the setbacks that uh, that Kelly mentioned, uh, structure height, and and these this is the full slate of uh, diagram showing the different setbacks as as buildings get bigger along those frontages uh, with uh, single family residential. Uh, 
and the whole building needs to move back. So these are equal, uh, these are the same as what uh, uh, is allowed on the existing campus and actually go beyond what is, uh, would the setbacks that would be required in the portion of the campus that uh, was previously general downtown corridor. Uh, and then uh, the other section of implementing code amendments uh, deals with the process. Uh, this creates a whole new section, uh, 1110.004, uh, which is highlighted by provisions for an early review by the city of a pre-application package that uh, is fairly, has a fairly complete description of the building uh, at a conceptual stage, uh, allows us to weigh in on, on design issues, uh, and then for the, the campus to continue going through their architectural review process. Um, and proposals submitted at that point would be available for public review. Uh, it also provides for permit application that expands on the requirements of the pre-application proposal and then uh, it includes criteria for amendments to the campus master plan as was discussed at some length uh, last year uh, and uh, as we promised to bring back with these uh, campus plan and code amendments. And finally, it, uh, it includes provisions uh, for applying the city's rec uh, regulations for uh, uh, potential demolition of buildings that are on historic register or, or inventory. So, so the st city's uh, rules will still apply to those buildings, and uh, those would those would still need to be reviewed by the landmark uh, preservation board. Uh, and then, and this is uh, kind of a repeat of one of uh, uh, Kelly's signs, but I just wanted to uh, again highlight this that there there were some pretty tough negotiations over some of these uh, items. Uh, and again, staff was, uh, was uh, we tried to be diligent in looking out for the interests of both the, the city as a whole and, uh, and the surrounding communities in, in coming up and identifying those parts of the PUD conditions that needed to be carried forward and addressed uh, in the development agreement and, and on other uh, um, uh, impacts that, that needed to be uh, addressed as well. So with that, uh, next steps, uh, we'll open this up for questions uh, and direction uh, for uh, any additional material that you'd like for the October 17th public hearing. That will be the opportunity for the community to give its input. And, um, and I do have the, the full packet for tonight's uh, meeting uh, available to pull up if you'd like to go through any parts of that in more detail. Great, thank you. Um, I've been along, I've been along for the ride for a lot of the public meetings, and um, so I feel very versed and informed about what this plan says. I just one thing I wanted to point out that this is probably one of the best uh, comprehensive plans I've seen, just from a aesthetic standpoint and clarity of what it's trying to describe. Um, I've actually took this to my day job and showed him like this is the new bar because um, it really does a, I think a really great job, uh, not only with um, demonstrating the, or you know explaining the data but actually showing visuals and making sure everybody kind of understands what it is that you're proposing to do so um, I, I think I think you've landed in a great place um, with the community input that you've received um, I think you've been very very responsive you you know we had a, a misstep for lack of better terms and I think the two the university and the college really came together and and, and did the best you could um, to try to to correct a misstep, and you came out with a, I think an excellent product. So, um, leave it at that. And do, does the council have questions or anything they'd like to have brought to the October seventeenth public hearing? Deputy Mayor. Um, so one thing that I didn't see um, in the packet was the general provisions of development agreements that we um, worked on last December. Um, it's in the ordinance. <laughs> um, but anyway, it, it, it includes some of the following. The development standards and other provisions that shall apply to and govern invest the development use and mitigation of the development of real property for the duration of the agreement. Does that sound familiar? And then I added at the end, and um, council voted to add protection of the integrity of adjacent established neighborhoods and cultural resources. So. I guess what I'm asking is I'd like for this to be part of the packet and for, um, I guess, um, these things to be addressed um, as far as where they're located or whatnot within the master plan. 
Okay. Um, and um, are we only addressing what we'd like to see going forward, or can I ask questions? You can ask questions and provide direction for the what you'd like to see on the October 17th public okay. hearing. Um, and then this sheet of paper that you gave us tonight on the campus development conditions is great, except when it tells us to reference the CMP without a page number, because it's a very big CMP. <laughs> so if we could have, um, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. The one that we, we yes. just received, um, that would be great just um, to reference a page number or a section. Um, and then I had, I had questions about, so, and I apologize if the, I'm asking silly questions, but I don't necessarily always understand um, the process. So when I read that um, the development agreement provides for the um, review to be done by the um, community development director, um, so we're taking the hearing examiner completely out of the process, and so I, um, I guess my question would be, is is that just the way it is with development agreements? Or I, I heard some comments from community members that they felt uh, hearings examiner was was more impartial, um, maybe less swayed by political winds. Um, so I just, you don't have to answer right now, but I'd like to have an idea of how that works and why it is that way within the agreement. Um, and then, um, I have a whole bunch of questions. Um, so when I look on page 12 of the Campus Master Plan, and Kelly partially answered this question, there's a, a sentence that says, it is certain that the campus plan that evolves over time will ultimately differ from this long-term campus vision. And so um, if I were a neighbor, um, Obviously, fear of the unknown is the biggest fear there is. And so Kelly did um, offer that it would be within whatever that development parcel was. So if it's in C, it's gonna be in C. Um, but I'm just, I guess I'm just wondering um, if they're recited within that, is there any neighborhood um, involvement in that process, or it, once we approve it, it can go anywhere it, they want to put it within that section of campus. So I'm just kind of looking for how does that work if it moves? So uh, the um, Title 1110 uh, deals with, or Chapter 1110 deals with uh, those procedural, and, and it spells out exactly what it could be done as a minor amendment, which would be done administratively. Anything else, uh, like a change to uh, the provision that doesn't allow dormitories in development area C, would be a major amendment that would have to go to city council. Okay. Um, okay. And then I'm just gonna, I have tabs throughout the, the book here. Um, Let's see, um, I guess the other question I had, and this goes back to that development agreement is, and we're, if we're vesting um, to the development agreement, what happens in the scenario that, say we um, update the tree retention policy? Is the, is the campus vested to the tree retention policy of 2017, or does that change um, as ordinances change? Or let's say, I mean, maybe there are other things, but that's what came to mind. Um, the other question was, are we vesting impact fees? Um, Cause that's on bullet point four, the amount and payment of impact fees imposed or agreed to. Um, I'd like, I'd kind of like to know if they're vesting to impact fees now and what happens if they change. Again, you don't have to answer this right now cause unless you want to. I'll actually, I'll, I'll answer in more detail uh, in the packet for the next time or at the next uh, council meeting, but um, in general, the, um, the that uh, chapter 1110 does spell out which, um, and, and, and uh, also the, the chapter uh, 1264 spells out what regulations apply per the, the to the, the campus, and it also says that uh, those that are not 
uh, specifically identified uh, the citywide regulations will apply. So campus development will have to apply with citywide regulations and as they are as they are updated. So uh, okay, and I apologize if I missed that. This was a lot to read. <laughs> so I, I did read the packet, but I may have missed that. I did want to um, say that I appreciate there. I had four bullet points in my notes on neighborhood protections um, from odors, um, some of the setbacks. Um, I'm curious um, when we talk about the um, potential of the parking uh, in Area C. Um, are we, and I didn't see this, but maybe I missed it, are we, um, in, within the development agreement, are we going to provide for mitigation or required mitigation in terms of noise or some foliage or how high the buffer has to, I mean, how much the buffer's grown, uh, what the plans are for that? So the campus, master plan went through of uh, FEIS, the environmental impact statement. So uh, we knew that those were some of the issues, uh, particularly around odor and noise. So we hired an extra consultant in specialty in those areas. So that's in the FEIS. So we, we can happily point those out to you, um, page and chapter. Um, what was identified that it wasn't any more different, um, let's say adjacent to the single family neighborhood than what you would um, see and um, is allowed within your current code. So that doesn't have to be specifically mitigated that way. Um, the buffers, now that's a whole different conversation. So the buffers, we feel like uh, you have the four images and that seemed to be pretty confusing. And so we wanted to make sure we had the images that articulated what the code was actually saying in different scenarios. So right now, as um, uh, last year, we went through and said, hey, we need, and the neighbors pointed this out, you haven't, you haven't planted your buffer. You need to plant this buffer. So we went and planted the buffer last fall. Some of the trees, a couple of them have died. So we're gonna go back and replant those again. Some of them didn't cover up the way they need to. So we planted a, a one or two extra for those particular visual impacts. Um, and so we believe that those will grow up over time. Um, if, does that help answer some of your questions? Well, I guess I'm curious. So I know you don't know definitively when you're doing what. Do you have a rough estimate for when you might be wanting to build that parking structure? And, and if you're referring to Area C, I'm always referring to the Area C, it family. seems like. <laughs> <laughs> that is the one. <laughs> it, 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 it is. Uh, in our actually in our community meeting um, we had in July, uh, we we, yeah, we had great attendance again from the neighborhood and and particularly around Area C. And so we talked through those issues. Then I covered up and I said, okay, so what do you think about the rest of the plan? Because that is equally as important to us mm -hmm. um, as impacts to the campus, as impacts to the community. So yes, in Area C, we don't know exactly. We're we're waiting for the twenty nine point five million dollars. So if you have some really sway of trying to get that adopted in the legislature, um, some magic fairy dust that would be helpful, that'd be great. But at this point in time, until we get the money and we design, uh, we don't know what construction costs are right now. Um, it's quite possibly could be surface lots instead of um, a structure because structured parking is very expensive and $29.5 million doesn't go very far. So it could be that we have a series of three surface lots instead of a, um, a parking structured lot instead. So I, I don't know the answer right now. We, when we get the money, we'll do a little bit of analysis and design and we'll have a better sense. Yeah, I was just curious because I, I mean, I think in general, I, I really appreciate the plan. I read it, it's very thorough. It seems very concise and clear about um, the layout and how um, you came to uh, the plan. Um, I'm just trying to address um, the neighbors, obviously, they, they, they don't have any certainty and so that creates a lot of anxiety. And so I'm just trying to nail down like what do they know? What can they know? Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that would help maybe alleviate some of the stress. Um, anyway, thank you. And on the hearing examiner question, um, every single plan that we've had to go to back to the hearing examiner, I think seven times, uh, we've had um, zero to one people ever come and testify at the hearing examiner on any of those particular points in time. So it's one of the reasons why we're 
going through this process is to have um, a process that makes sense um, and not spend those types of resources of a quarter million dollars each time with very little engagement. Right. Well, and I would agree. I guess the issue is that Zone C is different. And I, I mean, I, I doubt you can make different rules for different areas, but that's right. That's the issue because I, I don't see any or hear anybody having any issues with the rest of the plan. And so, um, Anyway, they don't have a voice tonight, so I'm trying to be their voice. Oh, they, they've been very expressive. <laughs> we didn't let them come up to the dais, though, or the podium. Um, Dave, I have one more question. Um, on page 416, um, I don't know what section it's in, but it talks about general height measurement method, and it says building height shall be measured in accordance with the IBC. So. What I'm wondering is, um, is that standard, I know we changed it for the hotels, which they're not currently gonna be using that change, and, and so I know it affected the downtown area. Is that why it's now applied in this Yeah, that, plan? that was to be consistent with uh, how we're doing it throughout the downtown uh, okay. sub area. Um, again, it, it's a little bit different to me when it's next to residential. I, um, let's see, what other questions do I have? Um, sorry, I have a couple more taps. Um, let's see. Oh, I guess I don't, they all went back to tree retention and so, um, I guess the other question that I would have about tree retention is that they, um, it's discussed in here, the problem with um, cutting down one tree or two trees and how it impacts the grove. And so the, the idea is that they would plant new rather than old, but I don't know how that's codified and how that actually works uh, structurally. I, I, I don't really have an issue with uh, that process, but I just wanna know how it actually happens. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the, the language in the campus master plan, so we can get back to you with more information about how that would work. Okay, super, thank you so much. Good job. Do I have a motion to extend the meeting? Yeah, we're gonna need more time. Move to extend the meeting till 9.15. Second. Let's move to second and to extend the meeting till 9.15. Please, please your vote. It's a formality, it's a knowing one too. Uh, it passes unanimously uh, with Councilmember Spivey absent and excused. Any further questions for the uh, Council Member Sabre? Yeah, I have some questions for Kelly. Thank you for for the the plan. It's um, it's very thorough, and um, like the deputy mayor said, I think most people agree with the majority of it. Um, there's just a few areas that um, people have concerns and questions. Um, so. Figure 6.1 is where you have your development areas, the six different development areas. And I was curious why you, since that is the long-term vision of development for the campus, why are you using the existing campus configuration to map out your development areas versus the long-term campus vision? Because the reason why I say that is that um, the the uh, the northern part of the campus is significantly different in the long-term vision, and if you look at the long-term campus vision, different development areas kind of uh, fall out from the long-term vision, um, namely this this C and D area, um, and. I, uh, as I read the document, I continue to have problems with the location of building D. I, 
building D is the, um, the, the building on 110th Avenue that abuts single family zone in area C. And as I read this document, it seems like we're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole in this particular area. We talk about, you know, at least in the city of Bothell, the importance of a feathered edge. This building destroys that. You talk about the importance of tree retention and open space on the campus. This building destroys that. And when I look up at the northern portion with the Husky Village, it seems like there's a lot more um, open space and treat area that is prioritized in uh, prioritized over this placement of building D. And building D, I'm wondering why that building space, that gross square footage, can't be incorporated um, in the Husky Village area. So if you had a picture of the long-term campus vision or even the 3D rendering. Actually, the 3D rendering is is um, even better because you get you get a sense of how that building D just sticks out. It doesn't it doesn't fit the contours of the hillside, which is what you've throughout the document you talk about how important um, conforming to the the contours is important for aesthetics, for pedestrian access, and that that building just sticks out. And then when you look to the the north, which is on the right side, right over there, and then even down with that large building, you've got all those trees there that are prioritized for preservation or restoration. Um, you've got open quad space between the existing um, Mobius Hall and you know the proposed new. I, I just don't, I, I don't see that that building D, it, it fits. And I, I don't understand why that gross square footage that, that you think could be incorporated in building D. And I know you say that building D is just for illustrative purposes only, but once it's in the plan as a box, it is going, that is going to take hold. And I would feel a lot better if you enlarged the boxes in combination of development areas C and D, you know, where you have in your, in figure 6.1 where you have the existing Husky Hall. Um, I would feel a lot better if that building D was erased and that square footage was incorporated in larger buildings in area D. Which, if you look in the long-term campus vision, that area incorporates Husky Hall. So, I, I, I just have, I'm continuing to have a very hard time um, accepting the plan with that building D there. When I see, when it looks like for me, the boxes that represent future buildings could be expanded um, and that open, that, that tree retained area would take priority over some of this other planned open space or planned tree restoration area in that Husky Village. So what we're referring to, so everybody else on the same page. Let's see if I can get the mouse working. Oh, there we go. So we're talking about this building right here. Is that correct? Uh, does anybody have a pointer, uh, like a laser pointer? Yeah, it looks kind of broken. About this. Oh, you're talking about this so building right there. Building D. Right there. Yeah. Where? It's in the development preserve. Right here. Yeah, there that's building D. Okay. The one that is creating a great consternation with the adjacent single family neighborhood, which is in the old plan, the development reserve area. Mm -hmm. um, that, I, I want to know why the gross square footage that is planned in that building can't be incorporated into um, where your area is that has um, the existing Husky Hall north 
um, to incorporate your newer Husky Village? So, um, things we heard very strongly from our neighbors was about tree retention. There's also some wet spots um, on the north end of the development reserve. It was really important to be able to retain those things. So you see in this particular image that those trees are all retained and we now have a view corridor through here. We reserve and preserve the two wetlands in those two locations. Currently, this piece of property is cleared today. There is not a tree in that particular area. There are rocks and uh, a corporation yard in that particular area. This building, let's see if I can get, this particular building does follow topography. We angled it as far away from the single family as we could and still follow topography. Um, it would be built, um, we don't own that property at this point in time, but it, if at some point we we're able to acquire that piece of property, um, it would be built on the parking lot and or where the Husky Hall is today. So in fact, um, uh, some communication from the neighbors are like, well, when can you start planting more of these trees that you are showing that are there are more shown in this image than there are there today. And so how we uh, I've shared with the neighbors, we, we can't actually start planting that we don't own that property. But in this particular scenario, we are talking about planting more trees. Now, why build on the development reserve? Why? Why not just give that up and have it all as a buffer It is a flat piece of property. We have to be have fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility of what we where we can build things on the campus. It is part of the core of the campus. Um, and, and it's important us to to be able to use the land that we can. It's already cleared today, and we're not impacting more things um, than if, if we built on another piece of property. And that was just a choice that we made. We have committed to the buffers. Um, we have committed to um, and the setbacks. So if you were to put in building D, you would not be removing any trees? As I have not designed and yeah. get ready to construction, I can't commit to you to that. But the potential does exist that that area could be replanted and the view corridor that you mentioned off of that new Husky Hall area with the little kind of the trapezoidal piece off the front. I mean, that could potentially, that little trapezoidal piece off the front could be larger. I mean, there's places where that oh, this. G GSF could be incorporated. That view corridor that you that you pointed out that's uh, to the left of that, that could be made smaller. It, it could be, but you're gonna impact the trees. We worked very closely with the architects <laughs> and the environmental uh, folks that to determine where those pieces are and the connectivity um, to each other. As we, there was a mention about what if you take one or two trees out, does that impact the grove? Uh, we, we have been very trying to be thoughtful about what happens next and to not have that effect. Um, there have been places on campus, the big mound where the flower W used to be uh, between UW1 and UW2, uh, those were trees that were a clump that um, had water um, impact to them. And we don't want to have that happen. So this is one of the alternatives that we have come with. Well, I'm going to continue to have a problem, especially when you show like the side view. It is, if, I, if I was a homeowner there and I saw that side view with the building envelope and the building height and the one to three setback, I would have... I would have no comfort in that. Um, the, that setback simply isn't large enough, and if 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 I had my preference, it, that building would not exist there at all, and that square footage would be incorporated elsewhere, not just in the Husky Village area, but elsewhere in the core campus, um, because I think it achieves some goals for the campus, but I also think it detracts from the goals of the community, and. I, I would just like to see um, more effort in making some of these other build, buildings larger to incorporate that gross square footage. Um, in terms of the transit access, you had two options. One was a um, transit center on Beardsley, and the other one was something that circulated inside the Husky Village area. 
So in the final campus vision, we um, were silent about what the final solution for a transit center was on this campus. Uh, what, it, what it occurred to us as we were going through the process and having um, comments, uh, uh, with our conversations with um, the transit agencies as they were not on the same um, timeline that we were, they're going to take several years. So we don't know the answer to that conversation yet. We need to continue to um, discuss what that looks like. And then, so what, what would the pedestrian access look like crossing Beardsley from the new Husky Village. I mean, I've tried to see, it looks like maybe there's a potential for a traffic light in one of these um, graphs, like figure 442 has a traffic light. Are these? So the, so the, traffic, the traffic lights and things that are off of the campus, those are within the city's vision for your transportation plan. The uh, crosswalk is currently already um, uh, in design with uh, the city staff. So uh, the, the campus has uh, provided some funds for that to be in design. So right now the only pedestrian access that the city and the campus have committed to is this 185th and that could serve as the long-term vision pedestrian um, access across Beardsley as well? In the partnering commitments, what you'll see is that there are additional improvements for pedestrian along Valley View okay. in this location. Plus the crosswalk on Beardsley. Plus the crosswalk, which is already in design, which will be in about this location. Okay. And so when it says a new vehicular access point is envisioned at Northeast 185th, that is not in conflict with pedestrian access? There is. Okay, so I'm not sure what you're referring to. There is no additional new um, vehicular access proposed. There's a restricted access at 185th today. There's no intention at this point in time to have that as a throughway. I'm just reading from this design principle in your vehicles um, section. It's in the colored shaded box. But that's Is this right. what you're referring to? It was under figure 443. The next page. But I might be working off an older draft too. But that's all my comments for now. Thanks. All right, is there any other comments from council they'd like to have uh, brought back on October, is it October 17th or November 17th? October 17th. October 17th, thank you. Councilmember Freed. If it turns on. Um, it's fun for me to see the uh, product that come out after a lot of work together. Uh, President Murray, thank you so much for your comments, talking about how collaborative you work together. It's obviously the effort you put into this, you turn gray through the process. Uh, but I remember meeting with you when you first got here and you said to me, uh, Josh, I refuse to let the, there's a little bit of disruption between the past chancellor and the past president of the two campuses. She says, I refuse to let that history continue. I wanna have a history here at this joint campus of leadership and collaboration and you and Wolf Gay have worked together and it's been a great example for our community. So thank you and this is a great example of it. Working so collaboratively with the community as you have, having so many public meetings I think has certainly shown the character of uh, what this campus wants to represent. That is a place of learning for people. My own son goes to University of Washington Bothell and enjoys his time there now in his second year. Um, it's a positive place for people to go to learn at Cascadia University of Washington. You guys continue to work together, so thank you. Uh, as far as goals, I think a community goal for me is having a vibrant city. And for me, that means a vibrant, active campus. 
and uh, there's been connections that have been, in, been able to be created with the downtown core. There's a lot of other connections that have happened with students going out within the community, being at public events, events that Cascadia and University of Washington held on our main street and other areas downtown. I'm excited that we are a university and a college community, and I wanna see that continue. I think this master plan points to your continued investment that you wanna have in the city of Bothell. Uh, the one question, and Kelly, your representation continually over the many years has been extraordinary, and it's fun for me to be able to sit here and see you be present and lead us so well in these conversations and really work well with Dave Boyd and other members of our staff here at the city. I uh, turn to page 162, which is the parking diagram for the building D uh, that Councilmember Sandberg was expressing. I remember originally this is gonna, the original vision a year and a half ago whenever it was presented was a potential dorm and that obviously was quickly moved away from and now it's a parking garage, correct? So it, there are allowed uses within C, just not a dormitory. So it could be an academic building, it could be an administrative office, it could be a surface lot, it could be a, a parking garage. Would you be opposed if it was a parking garage to have some type of vegetative um, buffering on the side? I looked at some examples online where there was some screening that was there and a few different vines that grew up. And so it was able to take the greenery up that back wall and maybe since it is sitting a little bit away from the property line, like 30, 40 feet, um, that would add another visual buffer to, to folks. I don't even know the expense and wouldn't want you to commit to it. But that's something maybe that you could talk about. I'm, I'm sure that that would be something we would consider. All right. Um, and then one thing that's interesting is our code, I, I assume, is prohibiting the site section with 35 foot height limit um, can we not go halfway back into that building and jump, jump up another floor? Our code prevents it and makes us go to like the example in the bottom right of the, those two pages of 163. First, are you re referring to 163 of the packet or the uh, this campus booklet. master plan? Okay. Where you got three yeah. stories here or you could step away okay. back 90 feet and go up six, five stories. So the code Currently, uh, the, the current regulations that control campus through the PUD are identical to what's shown here. Mm -hmm. that, um, that if you go have a building that has any portion that goes above 35 feet, the whole building has to ship back. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're correct, it, it doesn't allow the step, stepped up building form. Okay. Uh, well, I end with this thought. I appreciate the village that you put up by Beardsley and I think that connects to the other development that's down the street and certainly creates a connection with downtown. You don't walk to something unless you can visually see it and I think there's an opportunity from all, both downtown as well as um, the village at Beardsley Crossing to create something of appeal to walk to um, or walk away from and walk to those two other locations. So the thought of trying to be more part of the community, not so much of an island, I think is a great move. So thank you so much for your thought and for hiring a very uh, competent group working together to put this packet together. Councilor McNeil, but uh, will you extend our meeting again and be generous uh, this time, <laughs> please? I only need five minutes, is it? Well, we got another agenda item after you. Okay, so I uh, move to extend the meeting to 9.45. I'll second it. Go ahead, please your vote. Passes unanimously. Council Member Spivey, absent excused. You still have the floor. Thank you. So I, too, uh, appreciate the partnerships, both Cascadia, University, Bothell, um, so like the visioning process that you guys have taken us through, um, and echo what the other council members have said about um, the master planning process. I had a question um, maybe directed at Kelly around um, planning for natural disasters and how um, this particular master plan or how you, do you guys think about that during your master planning process? Uh, not particularly during our master planning process, but I work with a team that um, does our emergency uh, preparedness and emergency response. We were just in a meeting for about an hour and a half this morning talking about, you know, who has what role. Uh, I'm actually the liaison to the city. I know this doesn't surprise you. Um, how do we um, figure out how we have mutual aid? Um, 
Uh, we have a lot of students on any particular day on our campus as well as faculty and staff and um, how are we and, and housing you know if we have these students who are living there and their structure destroyed what are we going to do so we have plans in place um, uh, it's, it's important for us to work with the city um, two counties um, other local providers in the area to make sure that we um, are in a very responsive situation so so there is a you guys do work on that planning process we okay. do all right thank you Kelly all right, is there any other comments or needs for the October 17th? Seeing none, we'll move into, thank you, both of you, for your time. Good job. Uh, AB 17-162, update on the city's economic development activities, and I believe the city manager has the floor. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I don't really have a report for you this evening. I just wanted to provide you with some information with regards to our activities currently related to economic development. And most notably, there had been some information in the papers about our participation um, in responding to Amazon's uh, request for proposals for HQ2. Uh, and I just want to let the council know that we are working with Snohomish County Economic Alliance. We are part of that proposal. And they're actually working on two proposals in a parallel. One is specifically from Snohomish County. The other is a regional proposal. And we are engaged in those discussions. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions of the city manager on the HQ2 or other economic development? Councilmember Freed. I'd love to just get an update where we're at on a few of our parcels in downtown. I don't know if you have that information readily available now or we should talk no, about it another available. time. Cool. Yep. Uh, oh, you just want me to go through the, <laughs> well, okay, yeah, sure. I, I do have I a can... question about the, like the hotel here at City Hall. Do we know when that's coming or? Uh, so they've, uh, uh, we sold that parcel and mm -hmm. they've received funding. They did not receive funding for the modular units that, that they had hoped for. Um, the, the banks are not comfortable yet. That's only been built a couple of times in the United States. And so they did find a funding for a traditional um, structure. And so they're in design review now. And I understand um, construction could start in the spring was the last that I heard. Um, Correct, yeah, we anticipate uh, receiving applications this month and issuing permits um, late winter, early spring. Oh, that's exciting. And, and we hear about 16 months for construction, so a little bit longer than the modular units. That's great. Well, it should be a fun logistical thing dealing with parking with the construction folks in City Hall. Absolutely. Um, the other two blocks, I guess, by Gala de Oro and Baskin Robbins, then across the street. So um, what we refer to as EF and G, um, those have fallen out of escrow and are only owned uh, by the city at this time and we're continuing to work on the uh, environmental remediation on those parcels. We're working with the Department of Ecology. Um, a property D, which is across the street from that on the corner of 522 and 527, um, we continue to work with the Department of Ecology. We do have a buyer. We're in a uh, purchase and sale agreement with Regency. They continue to be an active partner. Um, we are looking at some tight deadlines coming up at the end of the year and are in, in discussions with them on how to handle uh, that we're coming up on those deadlines. But we have a very good working relationship with them. Great. That's excellent. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions of the city manager on economic development? Seeing none, do we have a motion to adjourn? It's moved by Councilman McNeil, seconded by me. Uh, go ahead, place your vote. <laughs> <laughs> We're adjourned. <laughs>